All right, good afternoon, everyone. The, uh, this is the, the last session of RossCon, and uh, keeping that in mind, all of these talks are fairly short. So the, uh, the first talk is given by Dan Stonier from Eugen Robot, and his topic is Ross on Windows, which I know we're all very intrigued to see how that's going. Okay, radio. Thank you for coming. Um, today, I'd today I'm just going to give an overview on what we've been doing in this area over the last year or two. It's been pretty slow progress. It's just a small side project. Um, it'll also be a little bit of an intro to Catkin, which I think probably most of you aren't aware of yet, but it's slipped in under the radar for Fruete as Ross's new build system. Uh, you probably won't really see that until Groovy. As Ryan said, we don't have much time. I was going to do some demos, but I'll just keep it to screenshots. If people want to see some live demos afterwards, you can catch up with me then. OK, when I think of Windows on Ross, I usually think of this. Um, I think it's probably the most unloved topic here in this room. Um, in my case, I, I feel that way a little bit too, which is a bit sad. <laughs> uh, difficulty, I think, at the moment is we have two kinds of people. We've got people like us. We're Linux devs. Uh, we absolutely don't want to do any Windows programming. Um, and then you've got Windows devs who take a look at Ross, and I've been contacted by quite a few over the last year and a half, and they really want to get involved, but they look at the build environment and go, whoa, I have no idea what to do and they disappear after about a week. In an ideal world, we could just, we could play in Linux and Windows guys would play in, in Windows, so why should we try and annoy each other and get this thing working? Um, these are a few use cases which uh, have cropped up at my company. Uh, when I came into Eugene, it was a 100% Windows shop and I very quickly grabbed the control systems, put them on a Linux board, and after about a year or so, I moved them to ROS. Uh, so in a Windows environment, uh, not only with the rest of my company, but with most of the rest of Korea, um, you've got users, you've got factory guys, you've got test engineers, most of them are all running Windows. So I very quickly had to find a way to connect, otherwise our control board was gonna be very isolated. Um, so I had to supply some tools for which the test engineers could test with, for which the factory engineers could monitor the robot with. And a little bit later, it's starting to happen now, we're, we need to connect with the software teams. Um, so pro initially, we were just looking at developing just some simple, quick Windows programs, dump that on the, on the factory engineer, and uh, run with that. But you've got other reasons as well. Some sensors only have Windows drivers. Um, that's quite often an issue. Over the last year, we've been interacting with groups, either software groups or groups with Windows robots or Windows interfaces, and, and we need to actually build a bridge to them. And uh, often, you'll want to utilize a PC sitting in a room somewhere. That's almost always Windows. So our goals are fairly modest. Um, we're not aiming to recreate the entire ROS ecosystem. That's something that I don't think can be done on Windows. It's just a really complex system and Windows doesn't scale for that, particularly with regards to the third-party libraries, your ROS DEP system. Uh, there's just nothing which replaces a ROS DEP on Windows. So we're just aiming to recreate the ROS runtime, the ROS comms, so we can communicate. 
uh, particularly the messages and the gurus. Over the last two and a half years, I've seen three relatively big hacks from Windows users trying to port ROS to Windows. And they've all just disappeared. Um, the biggest problem is that build environment. So these guys have taken ROS package by package, often, and uh, built package by package. Uh, the dependencies as well, and as soon as ROS upgrades to the next version, it's a lot of work to do that all again. It's not an incremental way of managing it, and so that build environment just kills it. So if you avoid the build environment, it's just not going to happen. The first thing we had to sort of really tackle was to, to make sure that build environment was compatible on, with what we have in ROS on Linux. Uh, so the big problem is the make files and the bash. Um, so at the end of Diamondback, uh, Troy Strazai and Willow started working on a, a new CMake Python-based build environment. Um, and I'll start giving you an intro into how that works. OK, so the original ROS build, it had the make, oh, the also the bash, I forgot to add there. Um, so we're just moving to a purely CMake plus Python build environment. It's going to be very disruptive. It, it's really gone under the radar at the moment. Um, you can link to it, you can still build the old way with ROS build, that will eventually disappear. But it has some considerable benefits. Uh, you've got a much faster build, you're only running CMake on your project, on your package, on the whole system one time. Previously when you did ROS make, you're ROS making for your robot, you're probably compiling something like 200 packages like we have for our robots. So you're com inv invocating CMake 200 times and uh, that's a huge cost for a compile. It's cross-platform, so I'm also using this for cross-compiling on ARM chips. Uh, it's really easy to set up for cross-compiling. It's easy to set up for cross-compiling with MinGW, and it's also easy to set up on a Windows machine for Microsoft compiler. It separates the source from the build. Always a clean thing to do. It's got more standard usage. Uh, a lot of the calls that we were doing were custom ROS XXX calls in CMake. They've gone back to trying to make it as standard as possible, uh, keep things as unsurprising as possible for the new user. Uh, it's got OS integration, it's got an install step, and packaging is, will also be a lot easier. So at the moment, the current release for ETA, you can have packages which are either ROS build, the original style, or Catkin, and you can see Willow has uh, converted their core stacks to Catkin, just to, to trial it for Ferrote. Um, everybody else's stacks, they've managed to link things in such a way so that it's completely compatible with existing stacks. So you get Willow's core stacks, and then you bring in your own stacks on top, and you can still compile the old way. Um, eventually, that first circle, I hope, will subsume the second circle. Um, and Windows on ROS is also using the Catkin stacks. So a bit of history. In Electric, um, Troy was proof of concepting the, the idea. You probably would have seen that in the packages if you saw a rosbuild.cmake in some of the core packages. That was the alternate build. Um, in Ferrote, you no longer have an alternate build. It's now exclusive, one or the other. And hopefully coming Groovy and beyond will be all the way to Catkin. So to change your package to a Catkin package, it's a little bit undefined yet. Um, there's not much documentation. It's probably going to change. Uh, this is a, the two areas where it changes. One is in your manifest.xml. It drops out a lot of the requirements there. The other one is in your CMake. CMake is where everything happens now. So you can see you define your project up the top with a Catkin project call. That sets a few variables and, and sets things up for your package. When you look for dependencies now, you do things the CMake way. You use a fine package call, and all of the other Catkin packages built by ROS will generate CMake fine package modules, so it integrates with that. Your dependencies now will require on fine package calls as well. Your messaging system is a little bit different. You can see that there in the green as well. So to build a set of Catkin stacks, 
this is what it looks like. You ROS install your, your list of stacks. You put that into a source directory. You make a parallel build directory. And then you just invocate CMake. Compile it, make install. Very simple. This is the um, CMake step. You can see it's traversing the entire stack tree. Um, it starts out with Catkin, which sets everything up. And down below in the red, you can see it uh, traversing the different stacks that are being built by Catkin. OK, going back to Windows. Our game plan, we've got uh, in Eugen, our control team, we're, we're not terribly interested in building huge Windows apps. We don't really want to go to Windows to have to build a simple monitoring or diagnostics app. Um, so we're quite happy using a MinGW cross compiler to do that. Uh, we do static builds, which makes it fantastic for deployment. We just give the factory engineer a, a static binary, and we don't have any problems with deployment. Uh, for cross-platform GUIs, we're using Qt. So we can build these natively, or we can build them with the MinGW cross-compiler. So we can use them as well as the factory guys. For Windows devs, um, the typical build approach is to use one of the Visual Studio IDs. So we're looking at packaging together an SDK for them, and then they can do whatever they want on top of that. OK, the MinGW cross-compiler. We're using. MinGW cross, um, it's now branching out to be a, a much more bigger environment for different cross compilers as well. But originally, it was just the MinGW cross compiler. It's a fantastic little project. Um, you just download a, a root tree, and uh, they've got build scripts for uh, probably about 50 or 60 different packages already. So you just tell it to compile. You can drop this on Fedora, Ubuntu, Gentoo. Um, it works the same way on all of them. Uh, there's usually no problems. So we drop that down onto the system. Um, I've got a package in WinROS which helps set that up. It also adds a couple of utilities which help us with ROS. Uh, it will go away and compile. It takes about eight hours on a, on a quad core to compile. It takes ages. Um, but once it's set up, it's no problem. OK. This one's not showing up very well. I wonder if I can. Or maybe you don't want to touch that. Uh, OK, this is an example of compiling the core Catkin stacks. Um, at the moment, we've ported the ROS comms, the messages, the, the common stack. We'll gradually add to that as we go along. Um, so it, could, it also compiles our Qt ROS stack as well. So we can build Qt programs around it. So it, it's like a typical CMake call, like the one we did before. But here, we're specifying two extra files. We're specifying a toolchain file. We're also specifying a ROS config file. Um, these are two files, two CMake files, which are located in the MinGW cross tree. And they help define where your tool chain is, uh, where your system root is, um, and also some build variables, particularly boost needs a bit of help to build. So once you've configured, you drop in, you compile, you can compile. You can install too, but you don't need the install step for this process. In this one, is a little bit different. You can actually drop into the particular package in your tree and just compile that one package. You don't have to compile the whole thing. This is an example. This is the toolchain configuration file from NGWOS. Um, this, will, this is standard for pretty much any cross-compiler. So I do the same thing with ARM cross-compilers. You just define the variables in the appropriate way, and away you go. This is the CMake cache variables I use for ROS. So you can see I've got a couple of uh, variables set to help boost, particularly for static compile. Also another variable which helps Windows too. This is the end result. 
So I have a, with my basic Qt ROS applications, I have a master chooser, so you can use envir environment variables to find your master, or you can plug in your URL and ROS IP. And that's been okay for about two years. It's fairly stable. Oh, this is really bad. It's not big much at all. Sorry about that. I hope that's not too confusing. Moving on to, to Windows and the Microsoft compiler. Um, this is a list of what we want to do. Uh, to start out with, we just needed to, to make sure we had build scripts and installers for the core roster dependencies. That's good. Uh, we're using the Windows SDK, which is great because it's free. Um, Express, I was originally using Express, but that one only comes with a 32-bit compiler, so we drop back to the SDK. It gives you your 32-bit, 64-bit compiles. Using N the NMake generator, um, so it's very similar to the ROS environment. And from that, we, we compile and we package the ROS SDK. Uh, in the last couple of months, we've got the runtime environment up and working as well. So we've got ROS core, ROS topic, ROS launch, all of your standard command line variables running too. So the goal with this is, for my part, is to get the build environment up to a point where Windows devs can just come in and they can start porting the stacks themselves and they don't have to worry about the build environment or upgrading the build environment. Also to make sure that they've got the tools they're ready to use and they can run with that. We haven't got much time, let's all breeze through this. Um, the Windows compiler is pretty much the same, except you've got no cross-compile call. Uh, we've got a temporary repository for patches, so while they're getting upstream, they can reside there. With the SDK, you can then build a project around it. Um, we've been doing some testing with MS Express. Um, I'll skip the runtime. Give you some examples. This is the runtime environment. We've got a, a ROS core running with a talker and listener there. This one is using your MS project, setting up a talker and listener inside MS project and running a ROS core outside. It gives you the full debugging environment as well. If you're interested in helping, um, the build environment needs a fair bit of intimate knowledge of the whole CMake, Python, Catkin environment. That's a pretty hard entry point. Uh, if there are people interested in Windows, we're almost at the point where it's easy to come in and just start doing porting of, of stacks. So in conclusion, we've got two methods to do Windows. Uh, one for the Linux guys, the cross-compiler with the static MinGW builds. One for the Windows devs. I'm not sure we'll ever get Windows devs really appreciating the power of the ROS build environment. Um, but at least we can provide a bridge across to our robots. Okay, any questions? <laughs> ROS launch. Yes, uh, I've got some examples in the Windows ROS repository. It will launch the talker and listener via ROS launch. That's no problem. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>